Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash NSS. Google I.O., Twitted Maker Faire, and turn your Galaxy S8 into a desktop computer live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, California. It's time for the new screensaver. Nice job, nice job, George from Sacramento. Look at that, and here he is, Jason Howell. Somebody said, is Jason unusually tall? And uh, the chat room swamp rat said, no, Leo's just unusually short. <laughs> it's a little bit of both. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Right? Bit of both. Jason Howell is here, of course, from All About Android and TNT, episode 105 for Saturday, May 20th, 2017. Yeah, it's good to be here. Good to be. It's good to be here. I wasn't here last week. You know, I got that terrible case of the flu. And now, thank you for Father to Father Robert for uh, filling in for me. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm back. I was in Colorado at the time for my yep. son's graduation. So they wouldn't was... let you go anywhere. Well, I got to go to the graduation. Well, at least that. But and I, but I sat there kind of like sick. shivering. <laughs> oh, that no, sounds miserable. I haven't been sick in, in years. I mean, I can't remember missing a show, probably in 15 years. But well, These things happen. I'm getting yeah. older. We have a we have a great show for you. Uh, Jason and I were down at Google I.O. on Wednesday. We're going to talk about what Jason saw at Google and uh, what Google's got in store for you. Yeah. We both have Samsung S8s. Mm -hmm. And I got a, I spent, I splurged, spent 150 bucks on one of those little Dex things that lets, it t lets you turn your S8 into a desktop computer. Jason and I will give you a review. Nathan Oliveris Giles is back. He went down to the Underwriters Lab. They built or rented a home in the South Bay that is a complete normal ranch style home filled with consumer electronics because they say well if you're going to test this stuff you have to test it in an environment that's filled with uh, that's filled with stuff with stuff okay so right. uh, we're I mean gonna, that makes we're, perfect sense to me. we're going to check out their living lab a couple of calls for help uh, and I think another game of geeks this time with Jason Calacanis Jonathan Abrams Peter Roja three entrepreneurs they're going to Battle it out over startup jargon. Nice. What do they know about startup? You know, one thing jargon. I know about this episode. What's that? Has not one, not two, but three Jasons in it. How <laughs> much I've counted so you far. You do like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> so we went down to Google I/O. I, you know, I hadn't been to keynotes for any uh, company in a couple of years. I think the last time was Google I/O three or four years ago, and I thought it'd be fun to go see the event. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking I'm not going to do that again. Oh come on! It was a blast. It was. It was. I fun. saw you with before before the event playing sitting, bubbles. Sitting there playing the bubble game. Who posted that? You were. I posted that. <laughs> Of course, I posted that. How humiliating! Was playing his bubble that? game. This was dopey. They keep you entertained before the thing's beginning with silly little games. Uh, this one, you're swiping down bubbles to catch. There are four teams of different colors. I was blue. We won. Yeah. Because I swiped fast. I think it was all because of you. Even though this is a worldwide competition, I'm pretty sure your efforts were why it won. Actually, one of the things, and I was curious what you thought about this before the event. They had two musicians, they've done this before, yeah. playing uh, kind of, you know, EDM dance music, mm -hmm. uh, using little touch devices That's right. connected. And this is what I thought was interesting to the Android phone. Now, in the yeah. past, we've always said you should, Android phone is not ideal for music, live music performance because of the Linux kernel and a 10 second, 10 millisecond latency built into mm -hmm. the kernel. And I thought, and they never mentioned it, so maybe I'm making this up, Google was trying to show us that the next version of Android, I'd heard the rumor, they had, has fixed this. They had put some, uh, some details, very limited details, uh, into the first developer preview, you know, in kind of the update of new features. One of the lines had to do with kind of 
uh, higher end audio and you know the the improvements that they're making around uh, professional audio p performance. So I have to imagine they put that in there as a demonstration. I mean, they were plugged into phones, right. not into tablets. Right. You know? So it was kind of like proving that that phone that you have in your pocket can be a sound you know, making device and that it's fast enough and responsive enough that you could use it in a live music environment. At the same time, we've also seen in the past hardware makers, audio hardware makers, figure their way around it by you know improving the hardware that that you plug into yeah. it just to kind of satisfy that requirement but all you have to do but is look at the number of apps on now. ios versus oh, the number yeah. of apps on android yeah it's big, in fact you big even difference. said this you said you're you spent so much money now on apps on ios to make music you're not going to move to android. not myself myself i've i i mean i have an ipad at home i just don't really use it very oh, much okay. i know a lot of musicians though that have and that they've just kind of integrated it into their music routine it's it might a, be too it's late it's another sound device right. in their arsenal you right. know and right that's kind of how uh, that's kind of what I fear is that it's a little too little too late for Android uh, for the music performance um, side of things but hey I'd rather have it than not so. Sundar Pichai the Google CEO by the way this is not an alphabet event this is a Google event. Google right so in past Google IOs Google was everything mm -hmm. remember Sergey Brin uh, and team parachuting in skydiving in that was that was to demonstrate stuff that is no longer part of Google. Yeah. So this was really kind of a little more, a little less interesting. It was a little more constrained uh, to Google stuff. So Nir Pichai though gave us some pretty amazing numbers. Good morning. Welcome to Google I/O. Two billion, two billion active Android users. No big deal. Two billion. <laughs> That's more that than one billion users for Google f search for. Uh, YouTube for Chrome for Maps. These are daily active users. Yeah, uh, I mean it's just it's just remarkable. People watched a billion hours of YouTube video a day. 1.2 billion videos and photos uploaded every day to Google Photos. Oh my God. <laughs> half the a scale billion, is just out of this. Half world. a billion active Google Photos users. 18. I'm sorry. One billion kilometers. That's a B, not an A. One billion kilometers navigated every day. Every day. With, I'm not with surprised about that at all. Google Maps is, uh, by by and large, one of the best apps that Google makes. And look at that. 800 services. million active daily users on Google Drive. Yeah. And that's big growth there. So Some of those users. They always like to kick off these keynotes with kind of a pat themselves on the back kind of it, talk. You're guaranteed to get all the outlets writing the article that, that kind of flaunts their insane numbers out of it. And yet, I mean... What it tells me is this is a company that's operating at a scale hitherto unknown. Oh, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, even Facebook doesn't have two billion users. I mean, that's amazing. They're certainly both playing on this in the same ballpark. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're both playing giants. the same game, yeah. and and they're yeah. they're doing some pretty insane numbers as a result. Pachai said that uh, we had been in a mobile first world. Even yeah. that was kind of new for a lot of us. But I go back to the desktop first, desktop operating system. Yeah. Then you remember with the advent of the iPhone, it became about mobile, mm -hmm. and in the last five or six years. Years, Google, Facebook, everybody's trying to figure out how do we make it on mobile. He says, not that anymore. Change. It's mobile first has gone to AI first. Yeah, and you know what what this really is when you really think about it, Google did something in mobile with Android where they have clearly dominated to a, you know a wide margin, 2 billion active Android devices wow. all around the world. They basically send let's take the mobile uh, you know the, the mobile landscape and paint it with our own brush and let as many people in as possible. Now they're shifting gears. It, obviously that's still very important, but the next direction and what we've been hearing about especially in the last Last couple of years has pause been it. this dedication to artificial intelligence. Pa pause it right so they're here. doing that with AI now. They're kind of taking the, the strategy that worked with Android and, and mobile devices and they're broadening that out so that they can pull developers in and empower them to use AI in whatever ways that they want. Get them on their own, you know, TensorFlow. Which is what that's you're seeing them, I mean, you're seeing Google Home, you're seeing they mentioned that they're gonna have uh, something new Google Lens in photos that will recognize your photos and help you understand them better. Yep. But look at this, they showed, back. go back to that sl the shot that I was asking you to pause on. They showed that they're now adding Smart Reply. Everybody who uses Gmail is gonna have Smart Reply. Yep. And they showed some Smart Replies, except, I don't know if you noticed, but this wasn't the smartest reply. <laughs> hey, Wilton Marsalis is playing this weekend. Do you prefer Saturday or Sunday? I'm down for either. Let's do Saturday. 
I'm fine with whatever. Look, Sunday was a bad day to begin <laughs> with, all right? Sunday, they had plans. <laughs> they left Sunday. On, I but, like to think that Google knew. Google had access to the calendar oh, wow. and said, your I calendar is that. full on oh, Sunday. Calendar I'm not Sunday. even offering that up. I won't even give you. But I do have to say, <laughs> I have used those in inbox, and I like those yeah. smart replies. And, they, they, you know, it's interesting to watch. And, I, I mean, I think these are very early days, baby steps. But as the computer gets smarter and smarter, it really can be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. Although you kind of feel a little like you're cheating a little bit when you use smart replies. Do you? I, I don't know. For me, sometimes I feel a little guilt. I'm like, I, what, I can't take the time to type out a five, five second like actual <laughs> answer I'm going to take? Well, but really, that's what I would have said anyway. So who's going to know the It's difference? just the start. It's yeah. just the start. Yeah. Uh, they're going to, this lens thing is cool. You can take a picture yeah. of a flower. It'll tell you what the flower is. Take a picture of an item. It'll tell you what it is and where to buy it. Uh, this is going to be built into Google Photos, and it'll be part of the camera. There'll be mm -hmm. a lens button, I guess, in Google's Android O that will let you say, oh, I'm... But now this is like the Fire Phone. Amazon tried to do this. There was that, and Google yeah. did it before, actually, with an, with an app called Google Goggles, which was very similar. Um, this was like 2011 era. I Android. asked, I asked uh, the woman who was working on uh, integrating this into image search, and she said... Well, the difference is Goggles was pre-populated yep. with stuff it knew. Yep. This is artificial intelligence, so it's learning all the time. It's happening on the fly, in the cloud, yeah. soon to be on the device, you, what you can imagine, because you know we'll probably talk about it. Well, they even said that they imagine light. that future phones will have yep. a tensor processing unit, a smart, a unit, a chip designed to do artificial intelligence Absolutely. in the hardware. Yep. Built embedded into the embedded phone. silicon in the Look phone. Look at this. I love this. this. Point it at, a, at the restaurants on the street you're at. It'll <laughs> tell you the rating of the restaurant, the name. You can make a reservation. I think that's augmented reality. I think that's pretty cool. Oh, it's totally. That's a great representation, a great example of the usefulness of augmented reality. My fear with this, I really think this is, this is a really, this is one of the, there weren't a whole lot of announcements at this event that were eye-popping, that were like, oh, wow, that was really cool to watch. This was one of those. I wonder if it ends up being one of those feature kind of like uh, Google Now on Tap, where when you finally get it, you use right. it a handful of times, and then you forget about it. This often happens with these things. Yeah. First of all, most of the things we saw at Google I.O. on Wednesday aren't available yet. Mm -hmm. I was a little disappointed. I wanted the photo sharing, and photos looked great. You know, yeah. you can share with a family member. They can share Shared with you. You can automatically oh. share. So anytime you take a picture of your kids, it'll automatically be shared with your spouse. Because it's already doing facial recognition, right? When you well, use photos, it's already right. going through and saying, all these photos are of your child. Give that child a name. Now you can say all of those photos that you recognize that are of my child, instantly share those with my wife through her Photos app. And They'll you know automatically go over, and even if I delete it on my end, she still keeps it. It's kind of, it mimics the real world idea of sharing. If I give you yeah. a photo that's printed on something, even if I decide I don't want you to have it anymore, uh, you still get to keep it. So keep that in mind. It's a shared forever sort of and thing. And you'll recognize this, but maybe you don't know about it yet. But as the dad, the photo taker in the family, you won't be in any <laughs> pictures. You'll look back at your daughter's ah. pictures, and there won't be any of you because you're taking them all. This happened to me. <sighs> yeah. That's going to be solved now because your wife will also right. be taking pictures, which you'll be in. Yeah. They'll be shared and automatically part of your photos. This, I think that's nice. This feature <laughs> actually good. answered a personal, uh, something from my own personal wish list. Because in order to do this up until now, my wife and I have shared the same Google account just for this. Oh. So we have, and basically it's mine, uh, so basically all of our photos are shared to one single account, so we have access to all of them. And that's bad for a number of reasons. Yes. Like having my account exist on another device for security purposes, I don't care if my wife has access to my account, it's just security purposes, if that phone gets lost, right. hey, there's, there's my uh, account out there. So this allows me to kind of peel that back and share the proper way. They also announced some updates for home, but the one that I thought was very interesting and really, I think, uh, puts us in the future a little bit. The Google Home device will be able to make place calls to any phone. Remember, Amazon's going to do Hello? it from Amazon to Echo. Hello? To any, any phone yeah. in the country, in the U.S. and Canada. So I can say, call mom. It will, I will have a, a conversation through my, just this replaces your phone. That is really cool. And there's no cost. Long distance calling was just made free by that. If you have one, um, you can sync your phone number to it. So when you call right. someone through your home, you. they, will, they will see you calling. 
Um, yeah, I mean, totally. That's a, seems, seems like seems a like a no brainer. Thing. Seems like a, a feature right. that needs to be there. I've wondered why you couldn't talk to people through your home because I've heard that it has you know, in order to pick up the vo voice detection, it has very good microphones. But they kind of lapped board. Amazon because Amazon announced Echo to Echo calling. Right. Now but video calling. So what do you think is more valuable, video calling? Nobody or... wants video calling. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. But but in fact, Megan, a little later, will show us how you can use your Echo to call another Echo. But you can't call a phone. Right. This lets you call phones for so free. Cool. That is no really more. Cool. I'm on long distance. It's I'm in a hurry. Quick. Now what I wonder is at what point we get handoff because it would be really nice if you start a call here and then you're like you got to go. You want to keep that call going. Transfer to my phone. Leave the house. I think it's just a switch. You know this didn't have Bluetooth until they flipped the switch. Apparently, I know, right? But there's it a was Bluetooth there. radio in this too. You can pair it with your phone. Uh, they announced books. Uh, beautiful Beautiful books, I think, to make and using artificial intelligence to make these books is a kind of an interesting idea. Um, I think they've picked a good provider. I, they, I don't know who the provider is, but the quality of the stock is yeah. good. These are ten dollars. Start at ten dollars for soft cover, twenty dollars for the hard cover, and they do, I think, a good job. But what's the key? The all the googly part of all this is you just say, make a book of my trip, you know, to the Grand Canyon. It'll pick the what it thinks are the best pictures. You go through them and reject them if you want, or or pick new ones. But basically, you can have these done kind of automatically. Yeah, you know, it, 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 they demonstrated selecting just a large swath of pictures. It goes through. It determines of those pictures what are the best. And the, I don't think that the idea is necessarily. I mean, it could be that you would just do that and accept willy-nilly exactly what they what well, they we'll say and well print it out it picks them but it's a really great starting point yeah. you know it, it picks out let's say 16 out of the 20 images you like right and then you only have to go digging for four more right well i'm going to test it because i'm going on vacation in nice. uh, three weeks so look at that too a yeah full, a two full page truck, spread two page uh i don't even think apple's uh, books can do that Looks so nice. apple maybe makes nicer books and of course they give you a lot more capabilities apple blurb a lot of these others you can mm. put text captions in and stuff this is very simple but i think i have a feeling i might be using that quite i think a bit. i will too they announced vr goggles mm -hmm. uh, we, they've had google daydream for a while but they kind of leapfrogged microsoft htc facebook by saying they're going to make vr goggles that don't have to be connected to anything you don't need a phone that's a daydream where you put your phone in it the new ones will be standalone they'll they'll have the equivalent of a phone built in and you won't need to be connected to a computer. The battery, the juice, the screen, everything will be all complete. They didn't announce availability or pricing, but they did say that HTC and Lenovo? Lenovo. Are yeah, going to be HTC and these. Lenovo. HTC is already kind of advertising it on their site. Yeah, I, I mean, another really big part, of, component of this, they did something that I've been wondering why they didn't do to begin with with Daydream, is that they're integrating their Project Tango technology into here for something called WorldSense, which essentially gives these, uh, these standalone goggles the capability of inside out tracking. So you don't need cameras positioned in the room to know where you are in space. You it can knows. move around. It knows because basically when you think about Tango technology and how it's working, it's constantly hitting the room with these multiple cameras and sensors to determine where obstacles are and to create an ongoing map, a more complex map over time. So they even say the more uh, The Verge was able to spend some time with the standalone goggles, they say the more you use it in a single room, the better it gets because the better a map it's able to create around it. I'd love to know the price point on this, but yeah. I I think this is for schools. I think that the idea is a school might buy five or ten of these. Oh, I could see that. See what I'm because saying? they were touting pretty heavily in the Tango area. I got to play around with Expeditions, which is their school mm -hmm. platform, which there they mm -hmm. announced AR capability now. So, you know, it showed all the kids with uh, selfie mm -hmm. sticks and the and the Tango phone basically looking like the demonstration that I had. It was a model of space in front of us, and we were able to go around the planets and take a look and go underneath and I see this it's the first time I've ever used a thing. selfie stick, though, so I felt really <laughs> weird. What but, about, uh, they no, talked about it. Tango and the ability to map indoor spaces. Yeah. I think this is Google trying to do Google Maps and Google Navigation for stores, oh, right? yeah, that's so right. So you walk into off. a giant store, you know, a Home Depot or a Lowe's, they give the example of Lowe's, and you say, well, I need uh, blue paint. And it says, it knows, and it says, okay, and you get an arrow and you get navigation. I mean, seriously, this is how cool is that? That yeah. is so cool. That's kind of, I find that uh, interesting. Uh, the, Tango will fit into smaller and smaller phones. Yep. And I think Google's hope is that, that, that phones will come Tango. Will come. Here yeah. we go. That would be the navigation you would see. Hey, your screwdriver's over here. Over yeah, here. Yeah, over Here's here. The, the light bulb. 
Here's Follow the go. light bulb. I got to play around with the new Asus, um, the new Zen Zenfone phone. that comes out yeah. this summer. That's what was in the Tango demonstration area. And I mean, it's as small and thin as any modern day phone. That was the problem with old Tango devices, that they were big, they were clunky, they were the internals were a little Initially. out of date. Right. And this is kind of like your normal phone, but with Tango capability. And that's pretty exciting for someone. One I don't last know how thing. widespread that is. One last thing, you were, you, you know, you host all about Android. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of this uh, Android O? You installed it. You and Jeff Jarvis immediately installed it. I yeah, I mean, you know, they, they pushed out the dev the first preview public to the beta, beta channel, yeah. and you can have that uh, happen pretty seamlessly in an automatic update. I installed it. So far, I'm liking it. There's little bugs here and there. The notification channels is actually pretty neat. Um, you know, uh, notification dots, so when you get an update in Twitter, let's say, the icon will show a little dot. It doesn't show you the number, so it's not as stressful. You know, it's just like, <laughs> here's a little dot that lets you know something happened in Something here. happened. I think the big story with O is less about the, the whiz-bang features, because you're not going to find a whole lot of those. Picture in pictures, smart text selection, whatever, there's a few of them. I think the bigger picture with O is it's a lot more on kind of the foundation, what's happening underneath. They announced something called Vitals, which is their uh, taking a closer look and, re and doing some re-architecture underneath to allow for better battery, which is something they've been working on for a long time. Better security, they, they spend a lot of time with Google Play Protect, which is constantly scanning and flagging inside the, the Play Store for you know, making sure that your apps are okay. Uh, startup time. I've never had a phone start up as fast as this Pixel does now with, with the new version of Android O. They really they cut it in half and stability. But even beyond that, an announcement that didn't hit the stage that I think is probably one of the most important announcements for Android this year is Project Treble, which Tr is... Treble? Treble, as in... I thought you said trouble. As in, <laughs> it's all about the bass, no treble. No treble. That was Dave Burke's it's, explanation it's the to Megan, me. the Megan Trainer feature. Yes, what exactly. Is <laughs> well, basically what they're doing, he, he said it, this was the biggest re-architecture um, that they've done to date of Android underneath the hood. Really? And what they're doing is they're separating Android, the OS, from all the vendor modified components. They're making it, in my, in my sense, it feels a little bit more like Windows, where they're allowing, they're working towards this reality where they can update Android, the OS aspects of Android, separate from anything that vendors are doing. So vendor hardware that's you know been tweaked and customized, uh, maybe eventually that extends out to on the top customizations that Samsung's doing with TouchWiz or whatever the case, but that's not treble at this point. It's just specific to kind of the hardware components underneath, and it's the beginning of something very big. It addresses the update issue, like directly. And now, I'm really excited about it, if you can't tell. One last thing. <laughs> And this is the thing that developers seem the most excited about. Yeah. And everybody else is going, huh? Oh. Kotlin. Kotlin. What's that? Kotlin. They made the announcement and they knew uh, they we were, were, were making the so excited. The everybody erupted. Oh my everybody God. went nuts. Making Kotlin an officially supported language in Android. <laughs> Every, I mean, if you were there, you would, you would have known how loud it got there. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, wow, I've got a lot of homework to do because I have no <laughs> idea what Kotlin is. Um, but ba so basically, Kotlin, Kotlin is a programming language that many uh, developers that I talk to say is uh, extremely elegant, way more elegant than Java, which is what most people have been programming. I think on. really what you're hearing is people hate Java. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's been a lot of resistance. They say Java it takes you know all of this extra time, all of this extra work to do what in Kotlin takes very little time, and uh, just this kind of emphasis on elegance and people were. We're hoping that Google would kind of anoint it with an official status as, as an official programming language for Android. Google did that, they listened, and developers were insanely happy about yeah. that. It, the good news from our point of view as end users is it will be a more reliable language, a more robust language. It uses uh, strongly typed uh, variables. It prevents a lot of programmer errors. So it's easier for programmers. Oh, they don't have to type semicolons? <gasps> mm. But it also is more secure, and I think in the mm -hmm. long run, that's a good thing for Android. And it's itself. very readable, from what I understand. It's very like readable from, you know, <laughs> more readable than let's say. Depends Java. what you mean by readable. Okay. Okay. Human, <laughs> human eyes, you know. I don't know. It's I'm not, not the most. Yeah, that's what they told me. It's yeah, <laughs> it's it's more. It's just a modern language that will prevent and programmer mistakes, which everybody's up for. Right. Anyway, you uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, you have a lot more that you're going to talk about on Tuesday at all about Android. Yeah. Including some really big interviews you did on Friday at Google with Florence Ion, Dave Burke, Stephanie Saad Cuthbertson, and Samir Samat from the Android team joined you guys, and I cannot wait to hear 
the conversation. And uh, you're going to play much of that on All About Anything. We're going to play pretty much the whole thing. It's about 45 minutes. It was a fantastic interview. Felt so just fortunate to be able to talk to, ba I mean, basically anyone that represented Android on the keynote stage. Yeah, these were, we got a, a, an interview with these, them. All so. three of these were on stage. Yep. And, and I got to give you a plug because they came to us and said, we love all about Android. Is there any way to get on that show? They're super excited <laughs> to uh, to be on the show. That's so, really great. Yeah, I, I mean, think we'll feel see very more fortunate. Of them. So that'll be Tuesday. Uh, twit.tv slash AAA will play that full interview and talk about other things. And I want to give a big thanks to uh, Colleen and Father Robert and Brian Burnett and Nathan Oliveris Giles and Patrick and Jerry. We all were uh, spent a hot day in the sun yesterday <laughs> at the Maker Fair in San Mateo. This is the original, the 12th annual Maker Fair. We met a lot of fans, but also saw oh, a so lot of fun. cool stuff. Lots of open flame Strange machinery Ooh. wandering the fairgrounds. Kids were having a great time. This is in the dark room. We actually, it's a little more lit than it really is in the room. When you're in the room, you can't see anything but the lit up stuff. These are shadow boxes kids made with all sorts of interesting devices. Maker Fair is, is so fun because it just shows human creativity, oh, creativity. ingenuity, Off the and, scales. and technology. This is a giraffe that would, would kind of bow down and talk to you. That's a lot of awesome. creatures, a lot of metal creatures. Oh, I got to bring my kids to this. Are you kidding? They would have had oh, a field it's, day. It's the, it's this the, looks the awesome. most fun. If you get a chance to go to a Maker Faire, please do. It's continuing through the weekend, this weekend in San Mateo. Uh, a little pricey because you got to pay for parking and you got to pay for the fair. But boy, the kids will have a field day, spending a day there. There's some homemade robots, a lot of 3D printing, laser cutting, CNC machines, and yes, a dancing skeleton. We live in a pretty darn cool time <laughs> when our kids can go to a playground of robots. They get like, to control that the dinosaur. Future, they get to forge steel, ladies and this gentlemen. Is great. I love it. <laughs> robot Wars is there. They have the, um, oh, there's some, is that drone going to pick that robot up? It was like a lot of cosplay. Water skiing, but with drones. You know you're at a good event yeah. when there's an entire section called R2-D2s. <laughs> <laughs> There's just like a whole part of the fairgrounds with people's oh R2-D2s. This looks like so much fun. Yeah. I got to do this. Yeah. I've never been to one. I got to go. You haven't ever no, been? I've never oh, been. I think the girls would enjoy it. It's I know really, they would. really a lot of fun. Yeah. Anyway, thanks to the folks at Make Magazine. Uh, we love them, and we'll have more of them on the show. I think we saw Dale Dougherty and Sherry Hughes uh, were there, and they, it's just great to be down there. And go if you can. Go to Maker Fair this weekend. Uh, we will not be there. We were only there yesterday, but uh, we got shows to do. Uh, but thanks to everybody who came down. A lot of fun. You can watch their live stream, by the way. They continue to stream live from there. I got a, was an interviewed at twitch.tv slash make. Coming up next, Megan Maroney is going to show you how you, too, can make phone calls with your Amazon Echo. But first, a word from our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. I know that's the weekend. Maybe you're house hunting. Maybe you're just looky-looing. I do this. Do you do this? Go around just to see what the neighbor's house Sometimes. looks like. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. I've definitely going. done that. Yeah. 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 Look at not the medicine cabinet. No, no, they're having an open house. Not while no, they no, even no, live no. there. They're having an open house. <laughs> I'm not saying you just wander in. <laughs> the house is for sale, and you just go over. But sometimes you look and you go, honey, we should buy this. This is a nice house. That's probably why I don't do it more often. Yeah, that's I don't what need would to buy happen. A house again. Honey, we should buy this. <laughs> and then you just get your phone and you go to quickenloans.com slash NSS, and suddenly, within minutes, you're approved for a home loan that's tailored to you. That's Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans is the best lender in the country. I'm just going to say that, hands down. They've got all the J.D. Power Awards, but also, they're very forward-thinking. They really love technology. They're rebuilding downtown Detroit. It's actually really cool what they're up to. And... Because they know that we geeks are not that interested in going into the loan office, meeting the loan officer, bringing paperwork, shaking. We just want to get it done, right? You can we, do everything. Preferably at our keyboard. Yes, <laughs> or on your phone with a touch of a yeah. finger. You can submit the pay stubs. You can submit the bank statements, everything they need. You can even, there's a little slider. You could choose the rate and the term of your loan. Boom, and in minutes, not, you know, last time I got a loan, it took us a month and we had to keep submitting paperwork. It was so annoying. This is not a month, not weeks, not days. This is minutes while you're at the open house. Check it out. You can find out more at quickenloans.com slash NSS, equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 30.
30. Maybe you think, oh, we're not buying a house. We're not refinancing. But you know, you're, there's open houses tomorrow. <laughs> they always are. Put it on a post-it note. Put it on a post-it note. Quickenloans.com slash NSS. We, uh, Megan Maroney has become our uh, Amazon Echo yes. expert. Yes, expert. First of all, she somehow has managed to make it so she can, when she can say the word, she bloops it. I don't know how she does it. She's bloops. She just auto automatically says it backwards. <laughs> it just comes out wrong every time. Anyway, she's going to show us the new, they just announced them, calling and messaging features in your Amazon Echo Watch. Is there anything the Amazon Echo can't do from giving us the weather to doing my kids' homework so I don't have to to entertaining us on Saturday Night Live without making fun of Donald Trump or Sean Spicer? And now the Amazon Echo has added calling and messaging to its repertoire of skills. You can now make calls or send messages from your Amazon Echo or your Echo Dot but you can't do it yet from third-party devices that run Amazon voice services. You can call anyone you know on their Amazon Echo or their Echo Dot as long as that person also has an Amazon Echo or an Echo Dot and has updated their app. First, update your app. Next, complete the setup by adding your contacts. You can't pick and choose which contacts you add. You've got to add all of your contacts. If anyone in your contacts has an Amazon Echo, they will show up in your app. I don't spend any time deleting former friends and colleagues from my contacts. If you're anything like me, you'll see lots of relative strangers in your list, people you haven't talked to in ages, and you might not want them contacting you or sending you a bunch of messages. Josh would like to talk. Echo, answer the call. Hey, Megan, I had to tell you, I took one of my birds to the park the other day, the, the blue-headed pionis. We were uh, we were going over there. She freaked out once. She almost tried to fly away and Echo, stuff. Echo, hang up. Of... If you don't want these people to be able to call you or leave you a bunch of messages in your living room or your bathroom or wherever you keep your Amazon Echo, do some calling before you update your app. I contacted Amazon, and currently there is no way to block contacts from calling or messaging you, and they do not know when they will provide this feature. I'm going to block you. Yeah, oh. she is. Oh, wait, I can't. So once you got everything set up, you're ready to start making some phone calls. Echo, call Anthony. Okay, Anthony. Hello? Oh, hi, I'm calling you from my Amazon Echo. Megan, <laughs> yeah. this is the third time you've done that. Do, do you I'm have time to... time to get some editing work done. Okay, <laughs> okay. All right, um, I'll talk to you later. Bye. The Echo also lets you add things to your to-do list, which will show up on your phone, but it won't show up on your device. With a new calling, you can use it to give yourself reminders. Echo, send a message to Megan. What's the message? Remember to buy a really great Father's Day gift for my dad. Now you'll have that reminder on your phone and your device. Echo, check my messages. One for Megan Marone. Remember to buy a really great Father's Day gift for my dad. You can also make outgoing calls or send messages from your phone. Hey, Anthony, I'm calling you from my Amazon Echo. So try it out for yourself if you have an Amazon Echo. And if you don't, you can always just download the app and try it that way. I am Megan Maroney. I host Tech News Today every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific and iOS Today every Monday at 1.30 Pacific. Echo, check my messages. From Anthony, why you keep calling? <laughs> just now. <laughs> That's kind of a, 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 a. It feels like a big gap, though, that you can't block people, and you. Yeah, big mm. oversight uh, for the launch. But I was just actually reading on, on Google Home either. I think at launch you won't be able to block. Uh, but their, you can't their... block somebody calling your phone, right? They can call and mm. they can call. I guess you could yeah. actually. You could talk to the phone company and say. I suppose so. Block that person. So I don't know. <laughs> we, we, we're in a brave new world. It's all yes. new stuff, right? Yes. Mm. It's time for a call for help. On the line from Escondido, California, Jason. Hi, Jason. What's up, Jason? Hey. Are you a budding musician, my friend? Uh, yes. Nice. <laughs> what kind of music you like to make? Uh, electronic music. Yeah. Excellent. So, As, what are you using right now? You're using, I think you actually added that in here. It's, uh, are you using Fruity Loops? Because you mentioned that by name, but and that's a great uh, No, I'm currently using a Sound Soundation Studio, which is online. Okay, nice. And you want to open it up. It sounds like, well, what exactly are you looking for for your setup? <clears throat> I'm looking for that something that's more advanced and has better sounds and more realistic. Okay. 
So Fruity Loops, just for the ignorant dummy over here, is a looping program. So it takes instrument sounds like da 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 and you can loop them, you can extend them. It has drums, it has a variety of different instruments. Yeah. And you can make beats, you can make uh, EDM, you can make a variety of music just by taking those exist. You don't have to play an instrument, you just take those existing loops and mix them together. That's, right? a, that's a component of it. You know, a lot of the, the DAWs and, and music production Digital software. Digital audio workstations. There you go. Sorry, I'm yeah. so used to just saying that. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of them started with very specific kind of niches. Fruity Loops, for example, kind of had a little bit of that. It was also kind of started as more like a drum machine approach. MIDI. Very, MIDI. very involved with like drum machine programming right. that emulated a drum machine surface. Actually, this is how GarageBand started, frankly, and yeah, Logic. They, right? And then they open up, right? Another right. one was Acid. That was, that was, uh, very specific to looping audio files like you're talking about and then that opened up to become right. a fully functional DAW. so you could record a track record yeah. a vocal and uh, actually if you think about it that's what you want you don't want to just put down loops you want to add your own custom vocals and yeah and they like have that. to keep improving these things and give you a reason to buy the next the next version and ultimately over time users get really used to the workflow of that particular suite yeah. and then they want these extra features and right. what you end up with is a lot of apps that more or less do the same thing, but they offer different strengths, or maybe they're tailored better to certain um, certain types of musicians. Uh, Ableton Live, for example, is all about live performance. Some people use it like a straight-up uh, digital audio Pro, workstation, Pro but Tools, it's really strong. Pro for Tools that. is a recording tool, so yeah. you, when you made your album Yellow Gold, yep. you would record the tracks, mix them together, overdub things like that. Yeah, and Jason. It, it has so some what of these is you, what is it? Also. You're lo you're looking for a looping program, or all of the above, or uh, a producing program that I can use to produce music and all that. Okay. So you're going to perform it or others are going to perform it? Uh, I was, I mainly just upload my music online. Okay. Sure, to SoundCloud, right? Do you, uh, do you upload to SoundCloud or wherever? Uh, I use Newgrounds and Bandcamp. Okay, Bandcamp's Bandcamp awesome. Popular, I love Bandcamp. Yeah. So, what's your budget? Uh, Two hundred dollars. All right, all right. I know exactly where you're where you're at here. So I've got a couple of suggestions for you. Um, when Jason was shorter, he, he this is exactly what he needed. <laughs> Us Jasons, we're very familiar with the creative music producing uh, thing. So okay, so first of all, two hundred dollars isn't isn't a lot when you're talking about some of the fully featured digital audio workstations. Thankfully, there there are kind of different levels of, of DAWs that are uh, supported. So for example, PreSona Studio One Artist. There's an artist level. It's kind of the mid-tier level of the DAW. It's $99.95, so it's 100 bucks. Has 30 native effects, has five virtual instruments. You know, you've got a drum sampler in there, full sampler, a few synthesizers. Uh, you said you wanted support for MP3 export. That's an additional $9.99, so you're still well under the 200. The other thing that you're probably gonna want is external plugin support. So you can take in audio plugins, of which there are tons of free, high-quality audio plugins all over the map, VSTs and stuff that you can plug into here. That's an additional $79.99. So when you factor all that together, you can get a pretty decently stocked Studio One artist for right around $190 that supports everything on a basic level and, and really pulls you into kind of this modern um, production environment. Now, I'm going to get really geeky on you because okay. you could... If you're a Linux user, there are open source solutions that are completely free. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a musician, so I'm going to defer to Jason on this, but I hear a lot of people talk about Ardor. A-R-D-O-U-R. It's a full DAW. Actually, I think they have OS X and Windows versions, too. And it's free because it's open source. A lot of times when you look at things like GIMP as an open source yeah. alternative to Photoshop, they're hard to use, hard to learn. Yep. And yet, once you learn it, uh, people go crazy uh, go. with it. Have you ever seen Ardor? I don't know. You use commercial stuff, right? I've so. never, I've never worked with Ardor yeah, to be honest, yeah. um, and I had not heard of it. the the beautiful The beautiful thing is that you have a lot of options along this line. Right. My other suggestion is probably my main suggestion for you. This is my when you're done with this show, do this right now and check it out and see what you think because I think you're going to love it. It's called Reaper. 
And uh, I have not personally used Reaper, oh, I've heard such but it comes highly recommended. Yeah. It's, it started in 2004, entirely bootstrapped, no it's, marketing it's, budget. It's inexpensive too. Well, the the price the pricing model is amazing actually. Uh, it's free with full unrestricted use, no time limit. They request, it's a request, that you purchase either a $60 license for private use or $225 license for commercial use after 60 days. But that is merely a request. So you could very well download wow. this and use this. As long as you're not making money on it, you're in the clear. If you start making money, that's when you have to start thinking about paying $225 for the commercial license. But this is a really fantastic DAW. I have known many people that use this. It comes with a ton of effects. It even does notation editing. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's got notation editing. His They're calling me right now. His dad's checking in uh, with him right now. Yeah. We're, we're, we're saving your dad some money right now. With <laughs> Tell Reaper. your dad we're getting free. <laughs> but uh, the, the best part, like I said, there are tons of free uh, plugins that you can load into this because they I, support multiple I downloaded multiple this ages ago, formats. and I really wanted to play with it. I never got around to it, but I am very intrigued by this. I mean, the, yeah. the, the this is this is a I don't I think it's open source. It's an example of where you can. There's some amazing stuff out there. People who just want to help other musicians yep. make music. Yep. And I mean, you know, it, they're definitely making money off of this, but their pricing model is so wide and open that a lot of the users of it start free and then they realize, well, this is obviously totally worth it. And really their cost is so low, you know, at $60 uh, for the private use license. Like, wow. th then you can afford to spend the, the additional $140 that you have left over on your budget to buy a couple of uh, commercial plugins that fill the gaps of what you're looking for. This supports the standard uh, VST for plugins. It supports a ton of formats, actually. So that's Audio great. units on Mac as well. Oh, that's uh, wow, so it really that's opens amazing. the playing field for you, and it's a really great um, option for you. Great find. Reaper, okay? R-E-A-P-E-R dot F-M. Now, if I'm looking for a, like, to make money off of it, what would I be looking for then? Well, I mean, really, I mean, if you're taking Reaper as the example, that's what the commercial license is all about. I would, that's I still would, almost in your budget. Well, that's the thing. It's only yeah. $25 over your budget. It's $225 at that point. So maybe save up a little bit more. Or, But, I mean, the beauty is... You, you can get this and get started right away, right? You're not going to make money using this immediately, but you can get it right now and start learning how to use it, and that's really important. You're going to have to spend some time to really understand the workflow of the of the DAW, and then you know by the time your your Skrillex or whoever whoever your hero is, um, you know you can you afford the 225. Send Dre some loops, some beats, and if he likes them, say Dre, you got to give me the license for Reaper. And it's yours. <laughs> that's how you do that. Yeah, right? it's a pretty fantastic DAW. I think you're going to love it. Wow, that's now impressive. Does, do those uh, softwares come with lifetime updates, or is it just like um, online? I noticed. I noticed that you called that out. As far as that's concerned, lifetime updates. Like you might be able to find some DAWs that that might offer that. In my plugging around, usually they don't necessarily support that out of the gate. They but they give you upgrade pricing. So maybe the next ver major version comes out, and if you have a previous version, they give you X amount of a discount in order to upgrade. And um, with Reaper, I would imagine... They I, say unlimited free updates through version 6.9.9. So once so they upgrade be to a the next one... seven zero update, right. and it'll be a whole other $60. Um, yeah, which, I mean... Maybe even not that much. Which, to be honest, is lower than the upgrade price for right. most DAWs to upgrade anyway. Right. So there it's just like, well, buy the next version. It's, it's still only $60. If you even need to. I mean, a lot of times... <clears throat> out of the box based on what you're using for you can use that for years and years it sat, totally satisfies your requirements yeah, it's free, evaluated free for 60 days um, and uh, you know but I think you, the problem, part of the issue though is if you wanted to work in the music industry you'd need to use pro, you need to learn pro tools that's less and less of an issue now is it yeah there's there's a lot of cross um, cross exposure in the in the music industry. and I think just knowing how to make music on a computer yeah gets you a lot of the way there absolutely right? yeah. um, they're, they're using everything now it's it's really just like jack of all trades so Jason tell your daddy can use the uh, the uh, treadmill now it's okay we're done <laughs> and one last question sure um, am I able to like upload this or get it onto an SD card where if I'm going somewhere I can put it on a different or a different computer? Yes. Make the app uh, portable? That's, I mean. I don't know if it's portable, but you can, ins you can install it on any computer 
once you buy the license, you can install it. I don't know if you'll be able to run that entirely off an SD card, though. Um, no, 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 no. I'm sure I, you can. I don't think that you no, could no, do no. that. Because they, they need products. scratch disks. Yep. They need a lot of storage. They need all full access to the processor. So you would install it on the app. Why, are you thinking of going to camp or, or school or something like that? Uh, sometimes. And if I just go somewhere and I'm like, Doing yeah. nothing I'd like to be able to do yeah. this. Well, maybe I mean, maybe there is a portable version. You know, you, you might have your projects and your audio files on a portable drive. Then if you go somewhere, bring that drive with you. If you have to install Reaper, one of the benefits of Reaper is that it's a really low kind of file size uh, install process. They made it low for a reason. Um, yes, Reaper has a portable build. Congratulations. Hey! You're our winner Never today. Mind. Chicken, chicken, winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> yes, there is a portable version. I just looked it up. All right, that's awesome. Wow. See, solves all your problems. There's, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to DAWs. <laughs> and I don't even know what a DAW is. Jason, when you, you, when you get Reaper and you, and you make something, make sure and bounce it down and then send it in to us. Send us an email with yeah. the link because uh, we want to hear it. Yeah, we'd love right. to hear it. Hey, thanks. Good luck, Jason. Thanks, Leo. It's uh, great to talk right, to thank you. Thank you. Good Take to talk care. to another Jason. Jason, Jason and two Jason. of three. Do you on meet episode. every day? You meet Jason. So Jason, is it the most common name in the world? I man, I do not feel like Jason is the most common name <laughs> in the world. I'm actually surprised to find a younger Jason. I thought Jason oh. was just like of the '70s. Are you named after Jason Voorhees? I'm just, I, you know, I honestly don't know no. who I'm named after. I Jason think my and the Golden like Fleece. The name. <laughs> I a good hope name. I'm not named after Jason name. Voorhees. Wasn't he Friday the Thirteenth? Yes. Yeah, that's not a good Jason to be named after. Wait a minute, do that again. That was... I'm right. scared now. Hey, I've had a lot of practice. I'm sorry. Next week, Jason Ian Thompson, who does not do horror sounds with his mouth, <laughs> will be our co-host. Here's how you can ask me and Ian a question. Watch. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. We're going to go play with the Samsung Dex in just a little bit. But first, we sent Nathan Oliveris Giles down to the Underwriters Labs to take a look at their living lab in Fremont, a real home decked out with IoT devices. Watch. You may not know the name UL, but the likelihood is that you have a couple dozen products with a little UL logo on them. This is Joe Murphy, the head of business development at UL. And Joe, what do we got going on here? Hi, Nathan. Welcome to the UL Living Lab. Let's take a look inside. So while this may look like a regular home, this is actually a smart home that we use as a test lab Looking around, there's over 104 devices connected to the internet. Gee, how do you keep all that sorted out? Well, this is really all about interoperability testing and making sure new devices entering a smart home behave well in the ecosystem. Okay, so let's, let's take a little tour. So as we're walking through a standard living room, you can see some UL employees here. <laughs> and what we see in the internet of things with the smart home is a lot of it is controlled by voice. So we bring in real users to create different voice patterns and different acoustic parameters in each room. We have blinds that are controlled, lights that are controlled, outlets that are controlled, and also, coming into this room, smart TVs, more lights. Awesome, and so, since this is a lab, I'm guessing you're probably bringing people over, having them make noise, so you can really understand acoustics in a, like a real world setting, right? Yeah, so voice control is very important to the smart home clients and using different testers to test in a real world environment enables them to see how products will work. Coming around to the kitchen, we have internet connected appliances such as refrigerators, stoves, coffee makers, even the dishwasher. Over here we have an example of an internet connected vacuum cleaner, robotic vacuum cleaner. And so you're using different manufacturers for different products, again, to see how different things will work with each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. So many of these products will be tested in our lab, and then when it successfully passes the regulatory and compliance testing in the lab, we bring it into the home to see how it'll work for consumers. Okay, so you have some Google, you have some Amazon, you have some Zigbee, you have some Wemo, you got some Apple, basically any company out there you can think of, you want to have something representing their ecosystem. Yes, so it's a mix of companies and protocols. So we look at things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, in addition to all the different manufacturers of those devices. All right, I got a question. How often does stuff go wrong here? Because all of these different smart home ecosystems, they weren't built to work together. Things go wrong all the time, and that's really the purpose of that. <laughs> like right now? <laughs> <laughs> 
That's really the purpose of the house, to figure out what goes wrong here before products are shipping out to end consumers. So we're trying to end that consumer frustration by doing the testing in a live lab environment. All right, so this is where I'd be probably spending most of my time, the living room. What's up here? Yeah, so this is a fully connected entertainment environment. You can see we have Wi-Fi routers, smart TVs, um, mixture of devices here for uh, video services. And this is where it all comes together for the entertainment experience, but also Wi-Fi performance is something that's very important to consumers today. And having this real world home environment enables us to test Wi-Fi performance and have interference that customers would experience in a real neighborhood. For example, if your neighbors are streaming Netflix, it may impact your performance for your wireless network in your home. So this is really meant to be real world. Cool, so we have an Alexa speaker here, we've got a smart TV. Every single room, you've got some kind of tech in it. Yeah, because uh, when we're testing in the lab, we don't have furniture, but furniture can affect RF coverage, acoustic performance. So you see in a bedroom, we have much softer surfaces, and that could affect the voice recognition and beam forming of the microphones. Now, companies, they rent this house from you, or do they just send you stuff and then you test it out? So actually, we support both modes of operation. Companies can send us products, and we introduce it into our smart home ecosystem and see how their product performs when in entering the system. We can even look at things such as unpackaging the product, looking at the user guide, and the complete end-to-end -end user experience of bringing the product into a home. However, some companies are working on projects that they don't want us to know about, very secretive projects, and then we make the home available to them, and they can come here and do whatever testing they want, and when they're done, we configure the home back to a base level configuration. All right, we've got bathrooms, and it looks like we've got a couple rooms kind of built up as though, as though some kids were actually living here. Yeah, so these are actually set up to be children's rooms within the house. All right, so I like the, the 70s vibe that you all have going here. Tell me a little bit about that. Was that a stylistic choice or, or what? So we actually thought it would be fun to have a Brady Bunch meets the Jetsons vibe inside the house. So we are going with a retro style decor, but the highest tech smart home products to complement it. Now this office is as big as some apartments in San Francisco. This is huge. I uh, wish my office at home was this big. Yeah, uh, so what's this for? This is what we call mission control. This is a workspace that enables people to whiteboard their ideas, sit on a conference table, and have control over the experiment that they're running in the house. All right, well, how many homes does UL have set up like this? So this is the first for UL, and it is the first in Silicon Valley. There are other smart homes in the area, but we've really set the benchmark where other companies can come bring their products and all the ecosystems come here to work together. Boom, has right, thanks for the tour. Thank you. Nathan Oliveira's Giles at the Underwriter Labs. I was just telling uh, Jason, the Plume, the Wi-Fi guys, have built a similar house, and they say that uh, it's valuable for their testing. For instance, they didn't realize that the metal on the ductwork from oh, the furnace would bounce the Wi-Fi signals around and cause a problem. So they really have that to... That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So this, as you know, because uh, we've been flashing them around for a while, is the Samsung Galaxy mm -hmm. S8. Both of us have one. This is the S8 Plus, so the bigger one. Yeah, I like the bigger one. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful screen. It's a, you know, it's a... A uh, classic Samsung phone with all of the good and the bad that that uh, means. The biggest problem, as we've mentioned before, I have with it is that the fingerprint reader is just poorly placed. And it's not a weird easy placement. Use. You yeah. put a case on there, though, that helps because it gives you a little somewhere bit of a guide. To, somewhere to yeah. touch. But this is something that's unique. Google's not doing this. In fact, the only other company that I know of uh, that's doing this right now is HP with a technology Microsoft calls Continuum. If you have an HP Elite Windows phone, you can dock it and turn it into a desktop computer. Mm -hmm. Remember Motorola did this with the Atrix some years That's ago. That's right, yeah. Big flop. Mm -hmm. But they, the, the idea keeps coming back that maybe this, since it's got all the desktop power, it's a powerful processor, lots of RAM, all your stuff is on it, maybe this should be your desktop computer and you just get somewhere and it's you dock it. It's certainly a, 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 a real good example of how far mobile has come over the well, years. And maybe that that's, that's a lot of it is just to prove yeah. I yeah, think we that can is do it. it. Now, here's problem number one that Jason and I both have with this. This is the Samsung DeX, $150 dock. It comes with a Type-C connector. It's not wireless charging. The Type-C connector actually connects the phone, keeps it charging while you're using it, but also connects the phone's uh, capability to this USB port, HDMI out. The DeX itself is powered. 
There's Ethernet and a couple of USB ports. Mm -hmm. And we've connected it up to our, our TV here. Yep. And this is what you get when you dock it. You get a desktop. Uh, it's a pretty nice looking desktop, I mean, you know, as far as desktops go. Is it like go, a Chromebook? I, I guess it kind of is. Here's the start button, and these are apps that are specifically DeX optimized. Some I've got installed, but it also has a, a special app store that you can find new apps for, including mm -hmm. Samsung's own Office application. Well, that was, yeah, that was part of their announcement, that, they, they, that Samsung had worked with Microsoft to optimize Microsoft's uh, Office for right. Android suite to work well with DeX. And if apps are optimized for DeX, then you get some of those advanced desktop features like, you know, not just uh, moving around the window, but expanding it to go full screen, that sort of stuff. If you brought in something well, that was Well, let me launch Microsoft Word, all right? Here's the Word application. Now, this isn't the Word that you use on your desktop. This is Android Microsoft Word, but it's DeX aware and see, it's already optimizing. Oh, I'm going to have to log yeah, in to my skip. Microsoft account. You can skip. Uh, I thought I'd already done that. Yeah, can I skip that and just use it, just do sure. a trial version of this? Uh, it goes full screen, so that's kind of neat. I mean, that's, you know, and for full screen on this, in this case, means like a full screen uh, desktop. Yeah, um, that I looks can, pretty darn good. I mean, I think it's pretty good. Let me let me open a. I, I don't know if you, I can even open. No, I got to <laughs> sign in and do anything. I thought I'd done that the last <laughs> time we used it, but I guess uh, either I didn't or it's forgotten my sign in. Now there are applications. New York Times is also Dex aware, so you're going to get a desktop version of the newspaper that expands to fill it. Oh, uh, looks uh, pretty sweet. Yeah, I mean. I'm looking at a desktop computer. You can get a 27-inch monitor, real keyboard, real mouse. But there are also applications that are not... This is micro, uh, Samsung's own browser, the Internet. So, yeah, and Samsung's own browser, one of the benefits that you get out of this is that if you're using this browser, uh, it automatically defaults when you're running DEC to get the desktop version of the websites right. and stuff. So, I mean, you you know, it's, it's the same as if you had a desktop computer, right? It's, like, it's you're not going to get a scaled up mobile version. You're right. going to get the full desktop. And, and you get full windowing. So, I, you know, if I open another app, it's going to uh, be in a window of its own. And I'm going to be able to float it around. Yep. But notice this app. This is... This is a, a Android app that really isn't DeX aware, and so it's opened as if it were on an Android screen, right? And I can, uh, let's see if I can maximize it. Yeah, You might be able to, yeah. But so big big not, improvement, right? It's just, yeah. it's just using the same amount of real estate on a big white uh, screen. And so there are most apps, in fact, are not DeX aware. So you're going to run into a lot of apps that aren't going to take advantage of that extra space. And that's where, you know, where you're going to start to see either a Samsung's plan uh, working for them, which is that if they can prove that there's enough reason for developers to actually go through the, the work to do the heavy lifting to make right. this optimized for DeX, then they will. I'm guessing, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how much of a demanded, uh, you know, in-demand device this would be for developers to decide uh, it's worth their time. I guess that's our question mark. It's a, it's a chicken and egg thing, isn't yeah. it? Because uh, on the one hand, I, I kind of like this idea, but, but I don't know if I would... I mean, is it better to carry this and your phone plus a keyboard and a mouse and hope you can find a monitor wherever you land or just take a laptop with you? I'm not sure that this is a big improvement over that. I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's my personal um, kind of problem with this particular type of technology is it... It's mobile, like like one of the things that you know I heard a few times is that this is for the you know the the road warrior to take with them so that any place they go they have their desktop right. computer with them. So on one hand it's mobile, but on another hand it's very much not at all mobile because it requires all of these other things right. to bring with you too: a keyboard, a mouse, have some sort of a screen to plug into. I guess if you're going somewhere that has that happens to have a screen, mouse, and keyboard hang out there, and it needs a computer Maybe, to be brought in, yeah. then that works. But how? I mean, when does that ever happen? If you had a satellite office, yeah. I've launched my mail app, uh, and it's not Dex aware at all, which means I'm using it. I mean, this is no better than using yeah. it on a on a smartphone. Uh, on the other hand. If you want to use Samsung's email app, of you'll, course, you'll get the full it's going to give you the full experience. But yeah. uh, I don't normally use the Samsung app. So this is another way to, to get the Samsung apps. Let's see what the Gmail app does. Yeah, the Gmail app sort of adapts. Mm -hmm. I guess that's because Google has adapted it for tablets. So anything that's tablet 
uh, compatible will probably work. Yeah, maybe so. Yes, yeah, so I would imagine. Because it's that's like probably a, it's, the that's case. what it is kind of like. Yeah. We have a couple of other minor pet peeves. It doesn't use the screen of the phone when it's busy being Dex, which is weird because I feel like that's an opportunity lost. Well, especially because this is an AMOLED screen, uh, and just based on the technology of the screen, you're only using power if a pixel is lit up. And, and I mean, even beyond that, you're powering the deck so it's charging it while it's plugged in. Right. At least put like a little bit a of clock. messaging here that messaging. says a clock or something Anything. like connected to decks. You're on that decks. Way something's happening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a little uh, also. It, look at all the wires. Yeah. This is this is, this is not exactly an it's, elegant. Solution. It's elegant if nothing is plugged into it, but something needs <laughs> yeah. to be plugged into yeah. it in order to do it, and so maybe it's not. 149 dollars. I like the idea, and I think Samsung's ex execution is actually very good on this. It's better than the Motorola Atrix. Yeah. I would well, I've, argue I've, it's as good as Windows Continuum. I've seen a lot of people say that it's actually for what it is for the, the for the you know piece of the technology market that it's attempting to fill. It's better than Continuum. Uh, it's just I, I just don't know how many people you know a, a are going to get this because they need it, and B how many of the Samsung S8 you know uh, purchasers are going to go? Well, I'm I'm down to drop another hundred fifty dollars for this thing because I have a perfect place in my life. For Only it. Leo. <laughs> you can, you do get right click because uh, it is, you know, it's like a desktop, so I can arrange, I yeah. can get wallpapers for my decks and all of that. So, I mean, uh, you know, that's kind of look. There, let's, what, let's, one thing I did notice, I ran, uh, I, I did uh, this week in Google two weeks ago. Yes, when, from when this. you were out. Yeah, I did the entire show using decks. Yeah, and one of the examples of where things just aren't quite working 100% is when I'm in a Google Doc. I put a lot of notes. I embed a note into cells, into spreadsheets. And on a normal desktop, I can hover over that with my mouse, the note appears and I can read through it. Um, even happens on my Chromebook. Uh, but doesn't with this, this, yeah, it just doesn't work. I'd hover. The only way for me to see it was to right click it and edit note. So pull up the edit capability to see what's in there. Also, so little things like that. That's kind of the problem with this is you're relying on Samsung to give you that functionality and third-party developers yeah. to support it. And that doesn't in the long run seem like that's going to be a very good thing. That was kind of my fear when I heard about it. It's like, you know, yeah. uh, Mac, uh, Windows, the, the companies that are bringing you this, those desktop experiences have literally years upon years of experience of doing that and and checking the boxes and, right. and all that experience built up. Samsung's just getting into it. Of course there's going to be uh, speed bumps along the way. You know? When you're done, you undock your phone and the desktop goes down and your phone is is uh, still <laughs> saying Hopefully. Samsung Dex, but it'll come back in a bit. It takes a little bit. I use a third-party launcher. All my icons were really tiny after I did this. Is it but Samsung's now? understands it and, uh, and, and restores and it. And now you're back. Way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. I mean, look, this is, you, you know, see if you trust Knox, Samsung security platform, the secure folders, yeah. maybe you're thinking, I'm not going to leave my data anywhere behind me. I'm going to have it with me at Someone all Someone wants to carry it with them yeah. everywhere they go. Yeah, and another spy. thing I liked about that is if you're using Iris Unlock uh, and, and you have it, it plugged in this. here. Yes, yeah. the first time I used it, the little light shone, and then, boop, it let me in. I didn't cool? have to do a single thing. It recognized my Iris and let me in. So that's kind of so, Jason, how I think we're going to say maybe a do not buy for. I think you got to know exactly why you want this. If, if you're going to buy this, you know why, yes. and maybe then. But I, for the general, per, you know, purpose, someone out there that's kind of thinking about their next technology purchase, you, you got to have a reason to have this, yeah. and you know it if you do. Yeah, I, I always want to encourage companies to do innovative, interesting things yeah, like this. But sure. at the same time, I don't want to encourage you to waste your. Also, money. doesn't this look like a wireless charging pod? Yeah, it feels and like it should so, be. And if so. Maybe iteration two, make that top a little wireless charging. Nothing's pod. happening. <laughs> Nothing is happening. Nope. Nope. All right, time for another call for help. And guess what? Our this is I think the first time ever we've had a live call from help. George came all the way down from Sacramento. George, come on in, bring up a chair and uh, join us. He's our uh, school teacher from Sacramento. What uh, grades do you teach, George? I teach computers to middle school students and, and elementary school students. And you use Chromebooks in your career? Yes. That's nice. kind of neat. In fact, I think you brought one of the school's Chromebooks mm -hmm. along with yes, you. Yes, I did. A nice HP. So what can we do to help you? Well, my kids are all concerned about Android apps. They want them. They want them. They have them on their phones. They want to use them in the lab. Interesting. And I even have teachers that want to be able to put an Android app on the school computers and have them run. So my, I have two real questions. The first question is, I need some direction because I'm an iOS guy, and the I don't, Android is like some other 
distant planet far away. <laughs> um, so I have no idea, of, have any idea how to even get them, what are some good ones, that kind right. of stuff. And the second question is, can I load them onto our Chromebooks for student and or teacher use? All right, so question number one, I think the Android story is very much like the iOS app story. I'd fact, say they've very, Over very time, similar. they've converged, mm -hmm. so ev almost every app that you would get, except for a, f a handful uh, on iOS, is also available. So maybe your kids want to play Pokemon Go. Oh, bad news. There are a lot of apps that won't work very well on a Chromebook. Pokemon Go needs location awareness, right. needs a camera. It's, it's designed for a smartphone, so you can't even install it on a Chromebook. How late model are your, uh, are your Chromebooks? These are, these are 2015, okay. and we've got a new shipment of 2017s coming in oh, that's over the summer. Yeah. So Google says that every Chromebook sold this year and from here on out will support the Android store. This is a weird thing because it isn't actually running Android. It's running a subsystem, Android for Chromebook that is an envelope, a wrapper, that allows the Android app to make calls to the operating system and it interprets those. It's kind of like Wine, if you've ever mm -hmm. used uh, Wine for running Windows apps on Linux. It's not an emulator, it just intercepts calls and interprets the calls so that the underlying operating system can respond to them appropriately. That means, though, they've done a very good job. It runs pretty fast and almost all applications work except for those that require hardware features that aren't present on the Chromebook. One of the reasons I think they're waiting to 2017 is they want touch. In fact, you can run it, I guess, on a non-touch Chromebook, but it would be pretty hard to Man, run on an th Android. I thought that you could not do that, but apparently they've opened that up. I have to imagine if, you're, if you've got a non-touch Chrome, Chromebook, Chrome OS device, and you're running an Android app, you're doing a lot with the mouse and the keyboard. I mean, uh, that's what you'd have Instead to do. Instead of touching. But, but Android right. apps just aren't designed for that, you know, with that in mind. So, that, that's you know, mostly the little disconnect bit of a workaround. you get into is that yeah. apps, they don't even know that they're going to be running on a laptop. And right. so that's where, you, where you're you getting the problems. But things like maybe your kids like Minecraft, that should run just yeah. fine, Minecraft Personal Edition. Yes, we're in the process of getting the Minecraft server working. Oh, I bet they want to play that. <laughs> and yeah. once, the, once the deities at the district office allow us to oh, turn everything on, then we'll be ready to go. And there's a pretty good very so. a, a, array of uh, educational software yeah. you might want to use as well. Um, you know, stuff that requires a re rear camera, things like mm -hmm. that, they may, may not work as well. Depending, yeah. So e the easiest way to know if your Chromebook will support uh, Android apps is if the Play Store shows up in your app list. Because that's the signal from Google, yep, you win, you win the lottery, and that's how you install those apps. It's just the Play Store is there and the apps are there and you install them just as you would install an app on an Android phone. Now, I have the first generation Pixel, which for whatever reason Google decided is not capable of running Android apps. I'm pretty sure that it is capable. I think it was just old enough and they have you know, decided yeah, two years old, too old for us. So I, I didn't experience this, but on yours, when the switch happened, it just appeared. It was yep. just like one day you got yep. your little update icon, you yep. rebooted, and there was yep. the icon. Just to, it was just part of the regular updates. I can't ah, remember if it was 56. Nice. I can't remember which version. But you keep yours up to date. Yeah, I'm this sure. is, we're running 57 yeah. right yeah. now. So, so I, at one point, just one day, it turned on. You know, and originally you had to go into developer mode. Yep. But, that, but that's not, not the case anymore. Yeah. Uh, there is a hack I've seen floating around that allows you, if you get the subsystem for Android on Chromium on your computer, and apparently installing a number of applications, including Evernote, will do that, you can then take, <laughs> I'm not sure you want to do this, but you can take, but if there's a handful of apps that you're going to install, you can download those from, what is the side loader you use, APK Download? Uh, APK Mirror, Mirror is probably the, the okay. site that I would recommend. So you go to APK Mirror, which is just a website with, APKs are the files, right the Android files, Android package files. So you download, let's say you want Minecraft, you download the APK from APK Mirror. You'll download it on a Windows machine, believe it or not, run it through a processor that rewraps it to design to work with the Chromebook, and then you can, if the Chromebook has a subsystem installed, uh, run it by cop copying a new USB key and moving it over. That, in a way, might be a better process because then the kids can't just arbitrarily install right. whatever right. they want to install. Unless they're really super crafty and can figure it out on their own, which I don't You would be surprised. At all. Well, you would be surprised. That out. And, and, and frankly, I don't know how long this back door will uh, stick around. This may be something that was uh, around in the developer days and now that it's official. But what's interesting, I thought maybe at Google I.O., Google would say, okay, we're out of beta on the Play Store on Chromebook. 
but they didn't. Yeah, there really wasn't anything uh, about there that. There were rumors that maybe that's why Samsung and Asus were holding off on their high-end Chromebooks, and they mm. were waiting for Google to say, no, the Play Store is official. But uh, I, I don't know now what, what's holding up Samsung and Asus, and I don't know why it's still in beta, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I would even recommend doing this kind of hacking. But the good news is you're new. Chromebooks should work with the Oh, we hope Store. so. Yeah. That and whether we're going to spend $300, $350 a piece for the new Is iPads. It one, do you have a one-to-one -one program? Not yet, but we're we're pushing very hard toward that. We've just got a great big grant from the federal government to and, help us get there. Uh, interesting. And is that to buy iPads or to buy Chromebooks? That's up to us. So really, the school board is going to decide. No, no. I'm going to decide. No, You're my in charge? site's going to decide, yes. Okay, can I make a suggestion? Uh, please. Don't get an iPad. No. <laughs> they're expensive. They're hard to maintain. They're, students are going to break them, as you know. They cost more than a Chromebook, and I don't think they're as functional. I think a kid needs mm -hmm. a keyboard. Well, I gave mine to my grandson, so I'm... They're fun. Yeah. The kids <laughs> want them. I can promise you. Yeah, the kids you. definitely want them. The kids right. want them. I just feel like for a student... That's, what do you think? That's no, my I, would, I would completely agree. Yeah. I mean, and I think that that Google has, I think that it's proven itself in in the education market mm -hmm. uh, that Chrome OS is just the better fit for the classroom, uh, now, just based on sheer numbers because for for a number of reasons. But anyone that I've that I've talked to, especially parents, uh, you know, that have iPads in the classroom, wish that they didn't. Yeah, we went through this in the Petaluma schools. Mm -hmm. They have iPads and I, and they had Chromebooks, and I wish they'd go back. Yeah. Uh, when you do get your new Chromebooks, somebody will be administrator, right? Yeah, the district has an administration set up, and okay. we're currently in the process of discussing whether or not a lowly teacher will have the ability to actually manage the systems. Right. Because right now, there's three levels of bureaucracy that are managing the systems for us. Mm -hmm. And they're doing, of course, the one wonderful job, as all bureaucracies do. <laughs> they will be the ones who decide what apps your students can install. Right. You will not, once the Play Store is on there, you won't really have control over that. They could install any app in the Play Store. So that's why the school district will almost certainly say, okay, these are the 10 apps we're going to allow you to install. Mm -hmm. And I think you want that. Yeah, no, I, I don't need that kind yeah, of... Yeah, as long as they choose the right apps. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Hopefully they listen. Yeah. Well, George, I, thank you for teaching, because I think that's one of the most yeah. important things any human can do, is to, is to get a, give a kid a, a leg up. And I, I love it that you're teaching computers to kids. K through eighth grade, that's really neat. That's a lot of fun. That's great. What, gate, what age do they most take to it? Uh, do, do you know what's funny? The, the second and third graders are the ones that just dive all the way in. No kidding. The other kids want to do more playing and more goofing around, and they want to try and work around whatever's set up. But you put a computer like this in front of a second grader, and their eyes light up, and they'll be busy for as long as you let so them. Oh, they want to learn. I know, I, I know that for, for a fact. My yeah. daughter's about to go into the second grade. Yeah, and she's go. like right on the cusp. I know she's going to take right to it. George, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah, and thanks for what you do. Uh, next week, Nathan Olivares Giles will be my co-host. Do you have... No, is that right or is it Ian? I've said one. It's I've said Ian. both. It's Ian. I'm sorry, Ian Thompson, now I'm confused. Ian Thompson will be my co-host. If you want us to answer your tech questions, here's how you get on the show. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. Time to play the home version of our game. You ready? ready? Game Jason of Geeks. three coming up now. <laughs> It's time once again for the Game of Geeks, where we pit three geeks, to, uh, one against another, to test their technical knowledge. Joining us, some really first-class geeks today, Jonathan Abrams of Nuzzle.com. It's great to have you, Jonathan, and your Turing t-shirt. Is this a Turing test, this t-shirt? It's a test that Jason failed. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Galaganis. Nobody told me there was going to be math. Inside.com. And uh, Peter Rojas, who is now a partner at Betaworks Adventures. So all three of them have been investors. They know a little bit about startups. They've all three had startups. Mm -hmm. And our game today is startup jargon. You've all heard a lot of it. This is a uh, buzzer question, so poise your hands over this. I'm going to define a term, a startup term, and you're going to need to give me the name, that term, okay? Mm -hmm. And if somebody gets it wrong, then you're going to the other two. Term. I will define, I'll give you the definition, oh, you give me okay. the term. And uh, if somebody gets it wrong, the other two have a shot at it. So keep your hands poised because he could make a mistake. A product you are promoting and or selling but have not actually made yet and perhaps... Vaporware. Vaporware is absolutely right. We'll never make like 90% of the products on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. All right, question two. That's 10 points to Jason Calacanis. Question two. 
the HR recruiting hack of buying out a struggling company. What is an aqua hire? Oh my God, he even pronounced it correctly. Buying a struggling company mostly for its talent rather than for the products or services oh, it supplies. You can't actually see my screen, can you, Jason? It's, it's kind of, it's okay. Tiebreaker. <laughs> Jason wants to take home the hat. All right, here we go. Hands poised. A fancy word for a 10 slide PowerPoint present. Yes, deck. Deck is absolutely right, or pitch deck. The presentation that covers all aspects of your business in a concise and compelling way. 10 points to Jonathan Abrams. Peter Rojas, still with nil, not a zilch, but maybe he'll know what this means. A center that provides many startups with workspace mentorship. What is an incubator and or accelerator? sometimes cash. Absolutely right, incubator. We would have accepted accelerator. Thank you. Peter Rojas. <laughs> incubator. <laughs> Too late, Peter. You just run one. <laughs> Here we go. One, but can't Hands poised. It. Starting a company with what you have and little capital using friends. A uh, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping. Ooh. Boy, it's as if you wrote the dictionary of startup terms. What I, do, <laughs> what I do, people. What I do. What, define tech jargon? No. <laughs> startup uh, buzzwords. Startup <laughs> buzzwords is what I do. BS people to get their investment dollars. Here we go. I'm just he's, not into buzzwords. These buzzwords so. are from Jason's bedroom. He buzzwords <laughs> are my business. Keep going, Leo. Hands poised, ladies and gentlemen. This one I've never heard of. When a company making just enough money to cover costs and most basic living expenses in an unsustainable way, they couldn't take you out for dinner. They are... Jason. Ramen profitable. Ramen profitable, absolutely. I'd never heard that one before, but you, you got it. You probably made it up. Paul right. Graham. I'm editing the document live. Here we go. Add a game layer to your product to encourage people to... Peter Rojas. Gamification. Gamify or gamification. Know, absolutely, Dad. Button problem. Uh, game layer to your product to encourage people to use sorry, it sorry. with rewards. <laughs> Not to keep pressing your button. Uh, here you go. Hands poised. What a company is being valued. Oh, don't you read the whole question? No. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> You're out. You're out. Keep going. Go ahead, take, a, take a guess. Unicorn. Nope. When a company is being valued before they've taken investors' cash. Pre-money. Pre-money valuation, absolutely correct. Let's keep going. What's the score? 60 points for Jason Calacanis, Jeez. Peter, and Jonathan buzzwords, tied. Buzzwords for a thousand. Lagging behind with 10 points each. Hands poised. Something that all startups hope to do someday, charge customers for their service or product. Hint, grow first, blank later. Peter Rojas. Monetize. Monetize, absolutely right. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody doesn't like to lose. Bad loser. Um, ready? The bare bones version of a product required. MVP. MVP or minimum viable product required to achieve proof of concept. Slow down there, Peter. Here we go. Hands poised. <laughs> What happens when a company realizes its course of action is not living up to expect? They pivot. They pivot is absolutely right. The company realizes its course of action is not living up to expectations and decides to go after a different market or use its technology for an entirely new purpose. That's a pivot. All Here day. we go. All day, people. Here we go. It's another word for marketing that sounds way cooler and a technique. Growth hacking. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you did see the questions. We, they fed you the questions, didn't they? Keep going. Another word for marketing that sounds way cooler and a technique that focuses on quickly finding scalable growth through non-traditional and inexpensive tactics. Or just say growth hacking. All right, here we go. New one. A word for try something, do it wrong, and try it again in a slightly different... Peter Fail Rojas. fast. Fell forward. Nope. And trying it again. This, okay, hold on. Hold on. Remove your hand. <laughs> I'm going to start over again, and I'm going to reset right now. Iterate. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh. <laughs> a word for try something, do it wrong, and try again in a slightly different way in hopes of achieving a better that's result. What I do. Iterate. Iterate. I think fail fast. Till it it fell fast also, yeah. You can okay. let these guys combine their scores. Are you, are you ready? <laughs> He's very competitive, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. He does not like to lose. <laughs> All right. Everyone who presents at a TED conference believes they are this type of pioneer in thinking. Yes, Jonathan Abrams. Visionary. Not what we're looking for. 
Peter Rojas? Thought leader. Thought leader was what we were looking for. I don't know, though. I think he'd give them both 10. All right, last one, gentlemen. Here we go. A phrase comparing your on-demand services potential to disrupt a market with a particular ride-hailing company. Your potential to disrupt a market comparing it with a particular... Yes. U Uberfication. Ah, it's not exactly what we're looking for, Jonathan. Okay. Uber for X. Uber for X, exactly. Okay. Right. Uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's fair. It's well, not exactly it's, Uberfication. It's the same thing. So people call it the Uberfication. Uber, All I care Uber is that I invested X. in the first round. All you care is you won. Uber yes. For, you won't let us you forget won. that. <laughs> it was a blowout. Jason Calacanis. What? Uberfication. We, is Uberfication. You get the dongle from hell. This will connect with all your devices forever and ever. And ladies and gentlemen, we thank you once again. Here she comes. Miss Don't be jelly. Game it looks bees. best on you. Don't be jelly. We thank you, everybody, for joining us on Game of Games. Yeah! Oh, Man. How, did you, how did you fit that many people in the audience to make that kind well, of noise at the I'll end of the game? I'll tell you, when you I got don't... a Jason Calacanis... You got a Jonathan Abrams, you got a Peter <laughs> Rojas, all in the same Star room. power. Each of them obviously. brings their entourage, their yeah. secretaries, their uh, dog handlers. You get a pretty big group in there. In the all right, all room. right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, wow. That was, I actually that was of, really great. I was there and I was enjoying it. It was pretty, <laughs> to watch Jason just want to just shred everybody I else. think the last time I was on, we had a Game of Geeks and he lost. And uh, oh, it was not pretty. Not like that, it wasn't no, pretty. Not he doesn't pretty. like to lose. Hey, it's time for the mailbag. Let's roll her on in. Don't get hit. <clears throat> you never okay. know what's going to be in here. I'm always nervous opening this yeah. up. Uh, ah! 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 Sean Spice has been hiding in the mailbag. That's not a bush. <laughs> and we got these at Maker Fair. These, uh, well, what do you think they do? Just put them on. Uh, they polarize something. Or, oh, they do nothing. <laughs> you can't see a thing. That's because no. there's no total eclipse going on right now. Oh. oh. Those are, those are, and don't do these at home. You got to buy these or get them from somewhere. Make some, this is actually from Google. Google is handling these, handing these out and the University of California at Berkeley because we have a total eclipse of the sun coming up. Uh, cutting a swath right through the United States. When is that, John? August 21st, Monday. August 21st, Monday. And uh, John, are you going up to oh, yeah. Oregon to see that? Or yeah. say, where are you going to see it? Port well, south of Portland. South of Portland. Bedford. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Going it's been a long time since you've been able to see a total eclipse inside yeah. the U.S. 1979. Yeah. yeah. Since 1979. <laughs> John is the Jason Calacanis of solar eclipses. <laughs> He's like, I could go all day. I could go all day. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting, yeah. Here, pick a, uh, pick a question. Any question. And we closer. will go into the mailbag. You start. All right. Uh, let's see here. Clinton says, I am a Windows guy who just purchased a Nexus 5X, so I'm living in two worlds at the moment. I'm surviving well, but there is one thing that I am unable to solve by myself. On my Windows 10 phone, it's a 650, I found the contact groups very helpful. Every month I have a nine ball pool pool night with my friends. I just select the group and then SMS all members. Nice. Easy. Yeah. I have the same contact list on Android, and the group is now called a label in contacts, which yeah. I did check that out. Uh, I have found no easy way of selecting the group and SMSing all members. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Um, on Android right now, I'd say the default uh, SMS app is Android Messages. Right. Uh, but you don't have to use this. But it's totally, this is totally... Uh, broken as far as I'm concerned. You have to, in your contacts list, yeah. you have to open up that label, yeah. and then in the overflow menu, which is the three dots up at the top, you tap that and you say send a message. I think it's up there as send a message. And then it says send to what? And it pulls up a list of your messaging apps. You select messages, it brings that over to messages, and you can send it. There's no way to do that from inside the messages app to like uh, enter in the label name of bullying friends let me ask and you how this. to just pull it in let's say i am doing a share i have an article i want to share yeah. and it asks me for the name of the person i want to share it with if i type in the label will it share it to everybody in that group <sighs> wouldn't it do question. that question you think you, you would. would think that it should i can't I say I with, with uh i can't say definitively but i would that try would. that um because yeah but from what i could tell the label like the label that's created inside the contacts app isn't talking to ah. Android messages. When you actually do the method that I tell you, 
it doesn't show up in that app with anything that says the label. All it does is it brings in all of those it contacts that were in there, yeah. and it brings them in piece yeah. by piece into this new group text message. The other thing to do is investigate in your launcher. This is one of those things launchers really can help you with. If you're using, I don't think maybe the Google default launcher doesn't do this. Action launcher though does, Nova launcher does. Yeah. They have an actions widget, and among those can uh, be a SMS group or okay. a group of people. I use it all the time for quick contacts for you know people I text or call all the time. Right. But I'm pretty sure that uh, Action or Nova Launcher will give you a widget that you can put on your desktop. And if you oh, contact okay. these people all the time, yeah. that'd be the fastest way. Just tap just that. Just tap button. that and it yeah. auto-populates yeah. and move on with your life. I haven't tried it, but I'm but that would be worth a try anyway. But I mean, they, they do have group messaging, obviously, in Android messages. Android, and they, WhatsApp they, they, they has need to, it. They need Facebook to figure that has, out because yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty basic feature, I think. You create a group and you name it something. And the, from that day forward, all you have to do is type in the name and it would you know send a message to everybody. The saga do of that. Google messaging is long. Long, bitter, yes. and rocky, and uh, we're still waiting for them to come up with a good single unified solution. God, at this they've point, got Allo, at this point, I'm Hangouts, not waiting anymore. They've got Android Messages. <laughs> they have a whole bunch of other ones that you've never heard of yeah. that just you know are hanging out by the side. Yeah, or died um, already. I wish they'd make Allo everything. Right. Yeah, I was hoping that they were going to have some sort of desktop support announced at uh, at I/O this year. That's what I they feel need. like. That's a big gap. Uh, for for me, a messenger has to have a desktop component. Hangouts does, so I can, you know, if I need to do longer messages, I can use my keyboard. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. All right. And by the way, Hangouts will probably do this group messaging thing. I would bet you. Um, because that's what Hangouts is all about. It's groups, right? Except that Hangouts is basically deprecating if they haven't already. They don't do SMS, SMS anymore, unless you're unless your unless your project a Google Fi, Fi or user. A Google Fi slash Google Voice user, <laughs> which I am. It is so confusing. <laughs> it's a mess. I can't even keep Google. Up. I oughta. Uh, Next time you talk to those big shots, can you ask them? <laughs> Just ask them. I'll get a big fat no comment. That's what I'll get out of they that. They know. They're sitting yeah, in they it know. too. They're they're using it. Yeah. Hi, everyone, writes Jason. Not, no. Not this Jason. So our, there are four Jasons our fourth in this Jason episode. On the show. By the way, the 86th most common name in the United States. It peaked, just as you said, in the late <laughs> 70s, early 80s. Yeah, I looked on Wolfram sense. Alpha. That makes sense. I recently convinced, writes Jason, I recently convinced my IT department to let me give the Google Pixel a trial run for my guys in the field. We're a residential builder. The feature I want to take full advantage of is photos being automatically uploaded to Google Photos. My question is though, how do I create one account for multiple users? Oh, this is what you were doing, but he doesn't need to do anymore. Mm. I want to be able to see the photos every day from various job sites, but I don't want my men to have the ability to edit said account. That's oh, the key there's right the there. Catch. There's the so catch. you could create a group shared folder. Yeah. There's different kinds of shared folders. One, you you know, folder for grandma that only you can put stuff in, and one uh, folder with grandma that she can put pictures in and you can put pictures in. Yeah. But grandma is always going to have editing capabilities, well, right? Well, yeah. So so when I looked at this, you're you're right. This is kind of what we were talking about earlier. Um, there were there were two ways that you do it. One is the way that you know my wife and I have been sharing photos all along. You create a Google account specifically for this. Log into all of those phones with that. That account and then tell photos to share to that account that doesn't uh, that doesn't satisfy your requirement of not allowing them to edit what photos get uploaded there the other side of this is the other thing we we're talking about earlier which is this photo sharing capability that's coming to to um, Google photos shared uh, contacts or shared libraries there you could definitely have all of these accounts uh, share based on some sort of criteria to your account, and once that happens, like I said earlier, once it's shared with you, they can't leave it. They they can't remove it from your photo roll. It's as if they gave you a Polaroid and said, "Here you go, and you oh. keep it forever." Um, so there's that. Having said that, if this is their phone, like I don't I don't know the depth of which this phone is only for work or is it for work and personal? Because if it's work, for work and personal, that gets pretty complicated. How do you create criteria? that the Photos app knows these photos get shared to my boss and these photos do not. If it's 
you know, taking pictures of oh, locations or whatever the case may be. What you're saying be. is every picture that phone takes is going to get shared. If you do boss. shared library, which is, I think, probably the easiest way to do this, right. then you're going to get everything. And if they use their photo, their, their camera on their phone to take pictures of anything that is not work-related, you'll get that too. Make sure they know this. <laughs> this is really important. Now, in the new <laughs> sharing that they're going to turn on pretty soon, uh, you can only share pictures of your kids, for instance. It does yeah. face recognition. I it's wonder all if you based could, around that. Like if in every picture you wanted to share of the construction site, you had some sort of <laughs> picture, picture of the boss or something <laughs> that, that you just put You hold it up in front out. of every picture down at the bottom like or, a little watermark. Or maybe a logo or something. Maybe yeah. there's something you could have that would be unique <laughs> and you could say, hey, if this is ever in the picture, yeah. share it to the boss. Yeah. Is that a wild feature? Uh, Am I a, thinking of a strange workaround? I, don't I know. mean, that is a yeah. That's a little weird. I mean, I guess it would work if sure. it, if it's in there. As, get a get yeah. a little Where's Waldo doll and yeah. put it in every picture and just yeah. uh, see. He's sharing a picture of his kids. <laughs> of his cardboard cutout. But it's kids. a cardboard cutout. See, it's not actually his kids, and it still recognizes the kids. So I'm right. saying you could have a cardboard cutout that you could put on the site. Put it on the site. <laughs> take a picture. No big deal. Oh, you know, make it like of a weird animal, like a camel. And like then just say, if I ever take pictures of camels... Only share my camel photos. Share that with my boss. And then just have a little camel that you put in all the pictures. Because in your, re in your everyday life, you're probably not going to take like leisurely pictures, pictures of, of camels. camels. Right. Maybe you will. I don't know. Right. I don't judge. By the way, I understand that these, uh, these uh, uh, eclipse viewing glasses are available from Rainbow Symphony. Okay, I'm going to ask a really stupid question. Yeah. Why can I not see anything through them again? Because the, they're because not as it's bright so as the sun. Bright, because yeah. it's so bright, so, and that ramps it down so much that once exactly. the eclipse is happening, it, it brings if, it to a If you a go normal, outside and look at the sun with these, right. you'll see a little yellow dot. You can even see sunspots and flares. And so, of course, you'll be able to see the eclipse. I mean, because well. you put it, those on in here, it's, it's as dark. if you're putting a black, a right. black piece of paper right. on your eyes. Well, that's uh, that's because uh, this here is uh, ISO uh, uh, one two three one two dash two colon two zero one five. That's the requirement for solar viewing. Oh, okay, that clears yeah, it up right there. It clears right there. Well, uh, I want to thank. Where are you? Where did, where did everybody go? <laughs> I want to thank you all for joining us on the new screensaver. I want to thank you, Jason. Howell. Yeah, absolutely. Great job as always. It's a lot of fun. Catch Jason's work at All About Android every Tuesday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Don't miss this week's episode. Midnight big ETC. episode. This is the this one. Tuesday. Big, big shoe. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, Monday through Friday with Megan Maroney on TNT Tech News Today. That's 4 p.m. Pacific, That's 7 right. p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC. I'm Leo Laporte. We do the screensavers Saturday afternoons, about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. If you want to stop by, watch live, get in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. If you can't watch live, everything we do, Jason's shows, this show, everything we do is always available on demand. Just go to twit.tv, in this case, twit.tv slash NSS for new screensavers. Or, where you know, take that program that you listen to podcasts on, seek out Twit, seek out the new screensavers, push that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single episode. Thanks for being here. Am I looking at the right camera? And I don't we even know and anymore. We'll, and we'll <laughs> see you next time. Where are you? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? On the new screensavers. Bye-bye, everybody.